started. Technical debt is a subject that's very dear to my heart, as I'm sure it is for many others. <laughs> Technical debt management. Um, Martin Ebergall, there's the uh, join me. Please go add some comments, give a review, give me some honest feedback. I've been to talk a couple times with local user groups, um, the PHP user group and the Pro Linux the plug. A little bit about me, developing a PHP, uh, primarily I should say PHP, since 2005. I've done a little bit of this, a little bit of that, JavaScript, MySQL, Postgres, SQL Server, Oracle, uh, C Sharp, C++, a little bit of Java, whatever else, right? We've all done a bunch. Uh, master's degree in information systems, senior software engineer and team lead, I have a good team. Uh, we work on a, uh, primarily an occupational health screening, so if you ever had to go take a drug test, Pretty good chance it goes through our systems. Um, we don't actually test the samples, but we do all the rest. So we do the random drug testing, pre-employment drug testing, scheduling it with all the labs, all these integrations going on. We have a call center on site, all sorts of things going on. Uh, Security-wise, I have the SSCP, which is basically the child of the CISSP, and the CSSLP, which is the software developer version of the CISSP, both my C squared. Um, very good certifications to go get if you're interested in that. Uh, and love being outdoors. Of course, Utah is a great place to do that. Live up the road. Love heading up to American Fort Canyon, go fishing in a raft or whatever. Niebergall, any German speakers here? What do you think Niebergall means? I guess you got the explanation here, but that. <laughs> this is true. Niebergall literally is one who doesn't repay their debts. So it's kind of ironic I'm giving a talk about paying back our debts. <laughs> so true. Niebergall right there. Um, you can go check it out on answerstreet.com. And if you meet any Niebergalls, I'm related. Because <laughs> there's not very many. We're going to start off with an example. Have you ever had a request to go dig a hole? Your boss comes to you, we need a hole outside. So you go grab your little garden shovel and you go start digging, right? You dig a nice little Oh, yeah, we're going to put some pretty flowers on here, maybe a tree. Boss comes back out, and that's not going to work. It needs to be bigger. You go get a little bit bigger shovel. This is the kind of shovel I have for my boys. I have four little boys. They go get their shovels, and they dig a nice hole. Maybe it's a, about a gallon size. That's not going to work again. All right, let's go bigger. All right, so you go get the real shovel. We're getting a real hole going, right? Maybe a couple feet deep. Looking pretty good. Boss comes back. That's not going to work, right? Maybe it worked before, but it doesn't anymore. All right, we got the mini excavator. We're out there digging. This is pretty awesome. Digging a nice hole. We get a nice trampoline size hole going. All right. Not good enough. All right, let's go get the full size, the heavy duty equipment. You ever run into that at work? Maybe in a project where something <laughs> isn't as good or as big as it needs to be? You're told it's going to need to be one thing. It comes back, it's not good enough. Our projects start out that way. We throw them on a little server, right? In a couple of years, that server is going to die underneath the load that's underneath there. Um, the ability to keep progressing as we move through projects. University bid cells. These things are so awesome. Have you ever been to these? Love these things. All right, I've, I brought my, uh, my one of my favorite things. I got a USB floppy drive. It was a whole dollar at Utah State. I've also got a DVI to VGA. You never know when you're going to need that, right? You can find wonderful treasures. Here I've got a picture of my KVM switch I had. I got this thing for five bucks. I was so excited. Obsolete items are showing up there all the time. Things that are never opened. And of course you buy them and then you never open them, right? <laughs> Maybe you've got a pile of servers at your house that are P3 800s. Um, broken items needing repairs, piles of cables. Who here has a tote in their basement with a bunch of cables and totes? I do. I've got probably three or four. <laughs> okay, we all do it. We love it. University bid cells is their way of managing their technical debt with their hardware. If you think about it, they're getting rid of things that they don't need anymore. They're maintaining. They're upgrading. They're changing. It's continuous. It's an iterative process. So we'll go into some details about how we can manage our technical debt. This is a good example of uh, ways that a university perhaps does it. So the problem, you are asked to make a, an adder, right? You've got to add A and B. 
You go throw it up there, A and B, you're done. Looks good, right? That's bulletproof. All right, so we got to do some rounding on it, maybe. Okay, we missed that. It's going to be all handle floats, right? All right, it's looking pretty good. Then a string comes in, right? All right, we got to do some narrow checking, right? We got to see if it's a number or not. This happens all the time, right? You get a feature request in, you get a request for a project, and it's going to change. It happens. It's expected. Um, as with our code or projects develop, things are going to change, requirements are going to change. Perhaps you've seen this, your uh, file architecture or lack of stuff, more awesome stuff, more <laughs> awesome stuff, super more awesome stuff. Coding standards change, so there are no standards. And you see this going everywhere, right? And everything in the root directory. And while you're at it, chmod777 on it. <laughs> yes. Because <laughs> that's the only way it's going to work, right? Is this going intentional? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> Which one did I misspell? Oh, oh, even more super awesome stuff, yeah. <laughs> Good catch. <laughs> 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 databases, right? You got a database, maybe your DBA. You've got a table, and it's got a lot of denormalization in it. Ooh, love those tables, right? Um, perhaps my favorite, I've seen this in a project, timestamp as a string. Oh, yeah. That's awesome. That's going to work good. <laughs> uh, maybe you're using non international address formats. These kind of things, they're going to come up. Maybe you got another table, it's called Ving. It's so generic that anything can go in it. Oh, yes. And it's got 50 plus columns, and who knows what these three or four or five stand for, right? Undocumented, no, no structure to it. We've all seen these problems, right? These things are rampant if they're not kept under control. Uh, this is where technical debt is a, can write, wreak mayhem on your maintenance and your sustainability within a project. Um, this is, I'll have a couple examples. The first one was JavaScript. This one's a PHP example. Let's say you're using, you get an application. The first time you connect to the database, it's so exciting, right? You just got a database query. It worked. It did something. Then to find out that uh, this becomes deprecated. <laughs> and if that's all over the place, you've got a major problem. You've also noticed a security issue here. You're like a raw post being used in a SQL statement. Ooh, that's bad. <laughs> But it's exciting the first time you get to work. Sometimes we don't know when we're introducing technical debt to a project. Um, experience can help prevent that. Maybe you have a, a data format. Maybe you have some data, and it's got Bob, cats, and kittens all mixed together. That's <laughs> good, good luck trying to guess the format of that one, right? It's going to change. It's not going to be what you want. So the definition of technical debt, it's a metaphor. Nothing else. It is a metaphor coined by Ward Cunningham. He's got a YouTube video. You can go check it out. He explains that he's working on a financial project. And a way to explain to his boss the problem, he, he thought of the concept of technical debt. You know, as you work on a project, there's going to be issues. There's, there's going to be changing requirements. There's going to be things that aren't done ideally. The project's not going to be perfect right out of the bat. It's going to happen. And it takes some time to maintain it. And explained further by Martin Fowler. He's got a bunch of blogs on it and a bunch of others. Gave their two cents on it. I've heard thoughts that maybe technical debt is only introduced uh, knowingly, but that's not true based on because it's a metaphor, right? It's an ex explanation. It's a way of explaining the problem. Uh, technical debt is a consequence of poor design. Perhaps you're missing something. Uh, maybe you didn't plan it out. Maybe there's no architecture. Uh, maybe you don't use frameworks. Maybe you're not, you know, maybe that's, it's just not, you know, the project grows. You didn't use a framework, and then there's the problems as it grows bigger and bigger. There's prudent versus reckless. Um, a, an example of prudent uh, technical debt, from a, perhaps from a sysadmin point, would be you have, like I mentioned earlier, you have a, a project, you put it on a server, right? And as it grows, you, you maybe have to go start scaling it. Maybe your database starts out at a couple hundred meg and it grows to a couple terabytes. You've, you've got to make some changes. And it's OK to start out small. It was intentional because you wanted to save some costs, and you had a plan to change as it going on. Reckless, of course, you know, you got the cowboy coder over there. He's not going to, he's just going to do things his own way. He's, you know, maybe they're just going to 
unintentionally or just recklessly go through the code. It's incurred knowingly and inadvertently. I go back and look at stuff I coded six months ago and I cringe. Like, what was I thinking, right? Oh, even something maybe you did yesterday. <laughs> A little bit of sleep helps fix that. <laughs> um, there's the definition of technical debt is also that it's the work that is needed to be completed before the job's done. It's not done properly until the technical debt is cleared out. Sources, we got the iron triangle, first, uh, top and first, right in front. You have your time, your resources, and your scope creep. You have a project, you have a deadline, let's say you have a hard set deadline, and you have two people working on it, you really need about 10. You either got to cut some scope out, work a lot of hours, introduce a lot of technical debt, Maybe say, oh, the first round, I'm just going to do it the wrong way. I'm going to do it, come back and do it the right way. Maybe that's a prudent decision at that point because it's you know, just a mock or an example. But you can get yourself into trouble. Um, ignorance. I would say that ignorance is probably one of the biggest sources of technical debt. I have been ignorant so many times. I'm still ignorant. <laughs> ignorance is bliss. <laughs> you go write some code. You don't put a unit test up. It's good, right? <laughs> and then someone writes a unit test or turns on error reporting and there's some problems. A misunderstanding of the requirements. And that could be from all levels. Maybe the customer didn't explain it. And so then it went to the project manager and they didn't explain it. And then it went to the business analyst and it got to the developers. It went to the sysadmins, DBAs, and a misunderstanding of what's needed. Things go up. It's not what we need. We need to go change it. Your understanding of the project is going to change over time. That's okay. It's going to happen. Um, another one would be unwillingness or lack of motivation. If, a, uh, you know, if you're not willing to go do it the right way, maybe you don't want to go learn. Maybe you don't want to attend Open West because that's too smart. It looks like everybody here is smart. It can be the decision to come. Um, lack of motivation would be the example of uh, you, you just don't want to do it. You don't have the time to go and fix it all. You just, you're just going to throw it up there, right? Uh, maybe you don't want to do the test. Maybe you don't want to <laughs> code it in a cool way or do it the right way. The impact of technical debt can be massive on a project. Uh, increased time to deliver a new feature. You go in there, you got a new features requested, but because of all the technical debt over here, you, know, you shake this over here, this thing happens over here, and then that thing falls down. You've seen that. Um, increased time to deliver those new features. It's also harder to onboard new people. They've got to go figure out the application. They've got to get wade through some technical debt. Takes them on. Increased time to maintain your application. Even just making maintenance, regular maintenance on it, is going to be harder if you have more technical debt. If you have a lot of technical debt, it's going to bog you down. It's going to slow you down. It's going to be harder to work on it. Um, and increased time to pay off debts. You think about a, you know, if you take out a loan, you have a high interest rate, it's going, to, it's going to be harder and take more time to pay off that debt. You'd be paying a lot more in interest. If you can lower that technical debt, you can spend more time on the things you want to spend time on. Uh, you also have increased code complexity. The code perhaps is too tightly coupled. Perhaps the code is too much of a mess. The first examples of the files, everything's in the same directory. Those kind of things cause problems. It makes it harder to understand. Uh, maybe you're not using some of the technologies available within your you know, language that you're using. It happens. Software brittleness, your, that, that example there is, you know, your code becomes, you change this little thing and magic happens, right? Do we have magic in our applications? I hope not, but I'm sure we do somewhere. The more magic that's in there, the harder it is to dis explain what's going on the harder it is to maintain it. We have software bloat, where things just become so massive. Code is not reused, and the application becomes heavy. Co software rot, by just being there, the code is rotting. Uh, think about maybe the, your shingles on top of your house. If you don't maintain those, you know, a big storm comes in and blows some shingles off, you gotta get out there and fix them. And over time, you know, as, as the shingles weather, you've got to go replace them eventually. Roofs aren't made to last forever. Same thing with that software. As time goes on, it's going to rot or decay. 
and you're going to fall behind on versions. Uh, there's going to be perhaps you're not patching it, and you have there's major security issues. You know, Heartbleed comes along, and you're not patching it. That's that's a that's a problem. I mean, software rot happens naturally. Um, consider your personal finances. Think about where you're at financially, and consider your technical debt within an application. There's a lot of similarities. A lot of these you can compare them to. Um, think about maybe your personal credit score and how that's impacted when you don't pay off your bills, right? If you don't pay off your bills, if you don't pay off loans, your credit score is going to take a hit. Same with your technical debt. But if you don't have a balanced budget, <coughs> if you're spending more than you're bringing in, there's going to be problems. Same with an application. Same with a technical project. If you're not balancing those new features coming in with maintenance and addressing the technical debt, there's problems. Expenditures, are we going on you know, lavish trips when there's other things that might be more prudent? Are we saving up? Are we educating ourselves? Training, are we learning? Are we finding ways to help prevent the ignorance and help us become better at what we do? There's some very positive impacts from a personal loan or personal finance. You have education, housing, achieving goals, businesses require loans, they require debt. So there's some cases where it's needful, but it needs to be done wisely. And there's some major negative impacts of debt. Have you ever felt the loss of freedom? You go to work on an application, you can't change anything because of all the technical debt in there. There's so much interest accruing on it. You can't do the awesome stuff that you really want to do. You can't change things. Sense of hopelessness, this project is so bad, we're just going to throw it out, right? Uh, depression, perhaps you've worked on something and it's draining so much out of you, it's making you depressed. It's a huge, it can be a huge burden. You get a call at 11 o'clock at night or 1 o'clock in the morning saying that this thing's broken, it needs fixed right away. Hopefully, through proper technical debt management, we can take care of that, and we'll get to how to, how to address technical debt. Um, it can introduce stress. You, know, you walk into work, and you've got 20 people asking you to fix something. That's some stress. You know, the boss comes down, hey, this is broken. Customer, it's impacting customer base. We need this fixed. And you've got to stay at work until it's done. Um, and if the, if the software has bloat, if the software is rotted, it makes it a lot harder to work on it. Impact relationships with others, it can affect personal lives too. So, how do we stay within budget so that we're not running into these huge problems with these negative impacts? Avoid excess debt rather than perhaps working on a new feature or a change request, address some technical debt. You know, if there's this thing, you, you know it's in there, you know you want to go fix this, you know it's been a problem for a long time. Identify it, go address it, minimize your risk. Uh, stay within your means. Don't introduce things that are going to make it even harder to maintain or perhaps it's over your head. Um, do some research first. Do some learning. Uh, read some blogs. Uh, use available resources. If you have a mentor available to you, use them. Ask them questions. We have a lot of resources. You can go up find out so much information. It's amazing what's out there to learn. And again, the iron triangle, triangle scope, creep, resources and time. If we can manage these properly, we can help stay within budget and not go overboard. Um, time is probably one of the hardest ones. Resources can scope. You know, can we get rid of some of the scope that's coming in? Because that will allow resources to spend more time on something that's more important. Um, how, do we avoid, how do we avoid debt from an operational standpoint? Perhaps you are perhaps a project manager, or you're working with a project manager, or a business analyst, or other. Uh, planning, requiring requirements, gathering, analyze. This sounds like waterfall, doesn't it? Um, analyzing a project, documentation. We have this awesome, cool application, but no documentation. Makes it difficult, especially for customers to use. Acceptance tests. Acceptance tests, I would argue, also can fall underneath other, more than just operational, but. You can follow me there. This is the way those within, working within operations can help decrease technical debt, prevent technical debt mostly. Uh, 
by having some, following some best practices there. So doing the planning, figuring out, seeing if it's practical or not, identifying the real needs versus what are just cool bells and whistles. From a technical standpoint, technical debt can be prevented if we can use a framework in most cases. There's a few cases where a framework's not going to be ideal. But for, for the most part, there's frameworks available where people have gone and solved this problem and can save you a lot of time and headaches by using the framework. There's also caveats, of course. They do an upgrade, and you want to go upgrade, and there's, maybe it's not backwards compatible. There's going to be things like that that come up. So you got to weigh the pros and cons. Um, be open to, to new technologies. Um, perhaps this is like a decision of, do we use Git or Mercurial? Maybe it's a question of, are we going to use MySQL or Postgres or other? You know, maybe it's a JavaScript framework question. Are we going to use jQuery, Angular, many others? Uh, go explore and see what's available. Uh, maybe it's a different unit testing. I don't know. Uh, go do some research. Figure out what's going to work for you. Be open to breaking the tradition if it's something that's going to be better for you, for your specific project. Uh, from a technical standpoint, you also have unit tests. Uh, most languages I'm aware of have for one shape or another of unit testing. Um, from JavaScript, PHP, Java, so, so on. They all have various types of unit tests that can be done. Loosely coupled code. This is an example where your code is more modular. It can, be, it can run by itself without having to rely on other things. You know, if you have an app, a piece of your application that's supposed to send a fax, should it be talking to the database? Probably not. It's just sending a fax. They can send details back about that, and something else can go do the database stuff afterwards. But it should just do the fax, or just send an email, or just do this. Can you break it apart, modularize the code, so it's not so tightly coupled? Code reusability, and as you use more architecture, as a f you know, a frameworks used, as things are thought through and planned, code reusability goes up. As you use vertical and horizontal inheritance within the applications, your code reusability goes up. Uh, modulizing your code uh, helps promote code reusability because you can reference that module. Um, reduce code complexity, make things easier to read, easier to maintain. You know, think about if you can abstract that out. And maybe you can make an interface. Maybe there's something else you can do. Technical debt also, uh, from the technical standpoint, code reviews. Anyone here do code reviews? It's pretty good. It's a pretty good amount. I Initially, wasn't sure about code reviews, but I actually really love them because it gives me a chance to get feedback about what I can do better. Uh, I can have a peer say, hey, we already do this over here. You don't need to do that again. Go reuse this code. Or they can suggest, hey, you could abstract this out. Um, same thing with me. I can go and read other people's code and see what they're doing and become familiar with what they're doing. So then knowledge of the application spreads and a better understanding is there of what's going on from the other pieces that are moving. Um, there's a handful out there of code reviews. I've used a few in the past. Um, anything from, uh, yeah, there's a, there's a few. There's Ansible, um, Crucible, yeah. um, Bitbucket, GitHub has stuff. Um, there's a, it's a to blo blo or <laughs> I got a blank mind here. There's another one. Uh, I'll think of it at some point, I'm sure. But there's a whole bunch. There's a whole bunch you can go use. Go find one that works for you. Usually it's uh, associated with the type of uh, source control you're using. So make sure it's compatible with whatever you're using. Or maybe it's a good excuse to jump off to something else. So maybe if you're on SVN and you want to move to Git or Mercurial, maybe a good excuse or, or whatever. Um, coding standards. If you don't have coding standards, look into them. You know, each language has their own generally accepted best practices or coding standards. Uh, coding standards can help uh, promote good architecture. Um, perhaps it's even dealing with how you name your files or how your code is architected, how it looks, um, you know, how you even go down to tabs or spaces, that argument can be settled once and for all uh, if you set some coding standards. Design patterns, there's a whole bunch of design patterns. You go look it up, see what's going to work for you and what's not going to work for you. And it's going to change project to project. Um, and general best practices. 
good way to learn about general business practices is attend a local user group. There's a whole bunch that meet around here, tons of them. <laughs> you could probably spend a few nights every week if you wanted to going to a user group around here. Uh, from a technical standpoint, this is a pretty big one, uh, static code analysis, uh, continuous, continuous integration tools, and configuration management tools. Um, static code analysis would be like you're, you're running um, some analysis to see about uh, code smell, general code smell, for example. See if there's uh, issues with the code. Uh, maybe it's you know, well, how much of the code is being tested by unit tests automatically, right? Um, general code analysis, there's lots of tools out there. I said each language has their own specific one, uh, but static code analysis is a great way to work on that. Continuous integration tools. Um, who's using a t continuous integration tools, if you know what it is? Wh which one are you using? Jenkins. Jenkins? Well, Microsoft. Microsoft, yep. Excellent choice. Any others? Well, Travis CI? GitLab CI. Okay. Team City. Team City. What else we got? Bamboo. 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 Okay. There's some great ones. You know, these continuous integration tools are going to go grab your things and do other things automatically for you. It can go run your co static code analysis. It can run your unit tests. It can automatically deploy. It can do all sorts of cool things. Um, continuous integration tool, if you're not using one, go look them up. There's some great ones out there, some proprietary, some open source. Um, find again what works for you and what's your technology stack, what's going to work. Um, it can save a lot of headache from the sysadmins especially because uh, they can have things automated. Things will automatically go and do things. You no longer have to go and run the test manually. You don't have to go manually go do all these things. It's going to do it all for you. They're great. Um, configuration management tool, uh, Salt was mentioned earlier. That's a local configuration management tool. You've got Ansible, uh, Vagrant, or Puppet. What else? Any others that are widely used? Chef. Chef. Good, you got good one right there. These will go and automatically build an environment for you. Um, so a developer walks in, they use the configuration management tool, and get a virtual machine up and running in a few minutes. There's no longer a need to go set up each individual box, go install these different things, get it all set up. No need to worry about it anymore. Configuration management tool gets everyone on the same platform so that we can reduce the technical debt introduced. Uh, we're all going, we will all be using the same versions and standard, things are going to be standardized. How do you pay off the debt though? So we've talked about sources of technical debt, the impacts of technical debt, the problems that come in. We've identified some technical things and operational things we can do to address it. Um, but paying it off is the part where it really starts to stick. It really changes what you're doing on a daily basis. Make a plan, set some goals, and stay inside your budget. I have found, generally speaking, 10 to 20% of my time spent on technical debt management is pretty good. <coughs> Maybe different for each project. We, uh, we have a consistent plan where we go and say, for this sprint or this iteration, for this time period, we're going to spend X amount of time, maybe using story points, maybe something other else, or you can go address the specific technical debt problem. Maybe you're going to go and refactor the way that the database is connecting. You're going to get rid of, rid of those raw queries and, and architect that. You're going to make it reusable. Find the low hanging fruit, address those things. Maybe also hit some of the harder things that are harder to address. If you spend that time on a regular basis, you can get rid of your technical debt and the burden gets lifted off. You're not having that huge burden, that slowdown. You can address the code brittleness issues. You can keep the software from rotting so fast. Um, <coughs> identifying um, the actual technical debt issues, make a list. If you're using an issue tracker, go and make the technical debt issues so they can be signed out, so they can be worked on. Dedicate that time. Now, this can be something you can convince management about if they're not on board. You know, explain, you know, if you don't do this, we're going to have to hit a refactor. We're going to have to go outsource this. We're going to have to do something different if we don't address this problem. Uh, explain the benefits of, of keeping up to date. It can save a lot of time, a lot of energy. 
if we pay it off at a regular interval uh, with specifically identified items. So it's a repeating process. You gotta, it's got to be part of your plan. It's got to be something you're consistent on. So identify it, make that plan, and take that action. Go and work on it. Make it something that's not going to be you know, a, a drag. Maybe just don't make it something so negative. Make it something that's positive. I, I enjoy working on technical debt. It's fun. You get to go fix those problems that have been, you've been cringing about for years, maybe. Uh, maybe it's something that's, something that's been bothering you that you really want to address. These can be some fun things you can go fix. Uh, become more familiar with it. the architecture that you want. Uh, go introduce maybe a, a framework. Go start hooking it in. As we go and address the technical debt, it's going to significantly help with making the project more maintainable, more sustainable. There's uh, the theory of four rights within taking on debt for the right reason, the right time, the right terms, and the right amount. Um, so this would be when we need to take on some sort of debt. Uh, if you can identify the appropriate reason, maybe you started work on a project, there's not a lot of technical debt there, but maybe you do need to introduce a little bit of technical debt. Um, if, it's those, if it meets those four items, and those are the right terms, then go for it. Um, but also while staying within budget, right? You can't take on too much technical debt or it's going to slow you down again. So make sure it's for the right reason, the right amount of time. It's, it's you know, the right time of the project. It's not going to be a big resource drain. Make sure it's going to be the right amount. We, wanna don't, we don't want to introduce something that's going to be so bad to go change later. Have a plan of how you can address it. You know, whether that's a short-term goal or a long-term goal. Find a way that you can go take care of those issues. Professional development is a great way to help address those technical debt issues. As mentioned, participate in local user groups. Um, what other user groups are around here? What, is what do people go to? Go ahead. What else? Okay. Any others people attend here? AngularJS. Angular That's great. There's, there's a lot of user groups around here. Um, go look up their websites. They usually have a regular meeting. They, they have, <coughs> and you can network with people. You can talk to people. Uh, figure out what works for them, what it doesn't. Um, find an experienced mentor. Maybe someone you know that is really good at something. You say, wow, this person is so awesome at this. I want to be, I want to learn how to do that. Um, talk to them. F have, them, have them review your code, review your project, give input, get a direction where you want to go. Um, attend a conference, we're all doing that today. Um, it's been a good conference so far, I'm looking forward to the next couple days. Read blogs, learning. Um, I, I, I find that education is one of the things that's harder to do when it's when a project is chaotic because you're spending more time focused on fixing things rather than figuring things out or doing things the right way and it makes the learning part harder other than learning from mistakes but we have a chance to go and figure things out and do things the right way uh, figure out what's going to work best again it's project specific it's going to change depending on what you're doing and each project might be different the technology stack might change a little bit and that's okay, as long as we're keeping that in mind. When is it time to refactor? Oh, you've given up on your code base. It's not going to work. We're going to refactor, right? The technical debt has become too much. It's time for refactor. Or perhaps the, cust the requirements have changed or other. Sometimes refactor is going to be needed. Maybe you decide to change your technology stack kind of a refactor in that sense. Um, things to consider though before jumping into a refactor is the sustainability of the current solution. If you go and start working on a refactor and ignore your current project, is it going to be able to be sustained? Is it going to be able to keep going and meet the customer needs? If it's not, you're going to have to spend some time maintaining it still, even with the refactor going. It's going to have to be a split time. Um, keep in mind that a refactor is going to be a humongous effort. When you say refactor, do you mean like a rewrite? Yeah, a rewrite, complete rewrite from scratch. Yeah. 
it's clean slate, get rid of everything. You got two projects going side by side. In my mind, refactoring is. Yeah, there's, there's multiple levels, I guess, of refactor. You could refactor a certain portion of an application, or it could be re complete refactor, rewrite. Um, the refactor or rewrite in this scenario, it's a large effort, humongous effort. It's going to take tons of resources, but there's going to be long term benefits that are going to be very good. Um, the understanding of that project is going to be much better than it was the first time around, uh, which will help prevent some technical debt. It'll help build the proper data structure behind the application and uh, the technology stack behind it. Um, explore again the technologies available. Like I said, if you're always using MySQL, look at other options. Maybe you want to use a NoSQL solution. Maybe Mongo is going to be something. Maybe Postgres. Maybe something else. I don't know. Uh, take a look at what other technologies are out there. See if what you're using is going to be best, and if not, feel free to change it. Get some ideas, get some feedback. Um, <coughs> explore those uh, different technologies that are available. Um, and of course, prevent excessive new debt. As you get so many new things coming in, um, we have, if you're in a rewrite situation, you'll be able to prevent a lot of the technical debt. Um, you'll have a better understanding of where you need to get to take the time to do it right. Again, unit tests are a great way to help prevent that um, when you're starting out that way. So again, technical debt, remember, it's a metaphor. It's nothing else. It's, it's a way of understanding how our projects are going to be working and what needs to change and what's not working. It's a metaphor. Um, technical debt is a way to... Uh, as we work through technical debt, we want to reduce our debt over time. If you try to go and splurge and take care of all the technical debt at once, the project's going to be at a halt. Nothing new is going to be worked on. Bugs aren't going to be addressed. Um, it's got to be something that's going to be an iterative project process, something that is sustainable, something you can keep doing as time goes on. Be able to go and fix things over time rather than having it be um, something that takes all your time out. You've got to be able to pay off your debt over time um, rather than having it be um, something that's huge up front. You think about you know, maybe you get a tax return, you want to go pay off all your loan. Maybe that's something that's good, maybe it's not. But at some point, you've got to be able to do an iterative payment process within your technical debt and financial debt. And remember that there's tools available uh, for your specific project. Um, as we talked about, there's continuous integration tools, the configuration management tools, uh, static code analysis. These kind of things can be extremely helpful. And you can get those set up early. They're easy to set up early, much easier to set up earlier because uh, you can start getting visibility into code smell issues or uh, architecture issues. If there's code not being used or code that's being reused, or re copy pasted everywhere, copy paste detection is a great one. There's many tools that help you prevent that technical debt and identify it early. Um, through those continuation, continuous integration tools. Um, Jenkins CI, or Travis CI, and a bunch of others are out there and available uh, so that as you're working on your project, you can help prevent it before it becomes a huge headache or a big problem um, in your project. And keep learning. Uh, keep attending user groups. Keep attending pro uh, conferences when, when possible. Right? Employers not always going to let you go <laughs> for a few days. Um, but we can spend some time, personal time learning. Um, perhaps it's just reading a couple blogs, maybe subscribing to a couple of feeds and just reading, you know, 10, 5, 10 minutes a day. Maybe there's a YouTube channel you like to subscribe to. Maybe there's someone you follow on Twitter and they mention things, you go look it up. You can suggest using those projects. Um, as we become more familiar with what's available, the tools available, the frameworks available, the technologies available, the technical debt that's being introduced is going to be decreased, um, the project can be more sustainable. They're going to be easier to keep working on that project. It's not going to be as big of a problem to keep going forward. So um, keep your learning. Keep, keep moving forward in that, that realm. Um, I've got a few references here. You can go take a look. Um, uh, those are just some, some videos uh, from Ward Cunningham, Martin Fowler, Dave Larrabee, uh, Mark Nunman. Um, these are some good examples. And, of course, the ancestry, because Niebergall, of course, they don't pay off their technical, their own debts, right? <laughs> Um, any questions?
about technical debt management. How do you um, bring up the conversation with management about technical debt? What are some strategies there? Because <coughs> we've had some instances where the developers see that there clearly needs to be some effort spent, but the management does not. Right. So the question is, how do we address this with management? Uh, the developers see they need, but perhaps management doesn't. It comes back to the, the, the concept. It's a metaphor. It's a technical debt's way of explaining what the problem is. Um, explaining the long-term benefits of technical debt. Explain that you know performance will go up, right? Our applications will be faster. Things will be more they'll be more stable. We won't have as many issues. You know, going back to the database point, maybe if you have normalization, maybe if you have foreign keys and relationships and relationships database, it's going to be more sustainable. It's going to be more maintainable. It's going to be it's going to cut the cost down because it's going to be easier to onboard people and people are just going to move faster. They can introduce more features. They can have more bug fixes because there's less technical debt. So I'd go from that standpoint, hit the money, and explain the benefits. So I hand over here. So I'd, I'd go even further and say if you can quantify it, <coughs> quantify it. Like if there's a way you could track, like here's how much, you know, if you went to your bug tracking database and said, here's <laughs> how much time we spent on bugs, it was direct result of it. Right. These guys love numbers. If you can show that, like, look, we estimated it'll take, you know, 50K to, to kill all the technical debt and it'll save two million a year, you know, ROI speaks for itself. So. Very good. So tying it to some numbers. And that's uh, hard, but if you can do that, like, that's a big thing. And, and so it's similar with clients. Like maybe <coughs> you can have management if you're freelancing or something or whatever, that, that, that's the same strategy. You help, help whoever the stakeholder is see, you know, here's how much we're spending maintaining our debt. Here's how much it would cost to fix it. Right. So maybe like, it's not. Maybe you run the numbers. It's like, eh, we're not quite there. But um. that's a very good point. Tie it to the numbers. Figure out what it's going to be. It might be a little bit harder, but it might be a better way to convince management if you can. Maybe try and quantify morale. Like, if it's morale, like quantify. It. Yeah. Say, look, if morale's low. Seventy like percent <laughs> productivity, which equates to X thousand dollars a year. You know? Right. I've seen many studies where they explain the optimal number of hours working per week. And it's found between 40 and 45 is the optimal amount. So maybe if you're working on a project and because of technical debt, you're working 80 hours a week. You know, maybe saying, hey, if we can spend even just 10% of that time working on technical debt, the, our velocity will go up, right? Uh, maybe it's, you know, instead of spending, you know, a million dollars over the next year on developers, it's going to be, we're going to, just on maintenance, we're going to say, hey, we're going to be able to spend some of that money and use it on new features. We're going to get you that new feature you've wanted for that customer. You can go make that sale now. <laughs> That's a good point. Any other questions about technical debt? Yeah. Do you happen to have an example of some, something that maybe that you did that maybe didn't take a long time, but like an example of, hey, I went in, I found this, it was good, like a positive example. I got rid of some debt, it wasn't too bad. Um, Here's an example. Why it was bad in the first place and then what made it bad. Right. So I mentioned in the, in this question is give an example of actual technical debt that's been addressed. So I mentioned faxing as an application. We had an application, it was doing faxing. But it was so tightly coupled in there that if you changed anything in that, this is some of the oldest code in the application, if you went and changed anything, it would break. You know, it was, it was doing all these things that it shouldn't be doing. It should just send a fax, right? <laughs> that's all it needed to do. And so we went and re, re, we refactored that. We reworked it. We addressed that technical debt and made it modular. We made it modular so it could be reused by other projects within the business. So other projects could use it. They could go and hook into this faxing service. Uh, built an API for it. We went and made it reusable. And at that point, you know, it was saving money because other developers were able to use it within the business. They weren't having to go rewrite other stuff. And then we also made our application more sustainable. We didn't have this huge code mess sending faxes out and doing who knows what else. Instead, it was this very identifiable item. It was clean. It had unit tests up against it. It was good. So that would be a good example. Any other questions? Thanks, everyone, for your uh, time. Make sure you go uh, hit join me. Give me some feedback. If there's anything you want to see different or you suggest I do different on, on technical debt, give me some feedback. Um, thanks.